Welcome to St. Paul's Lutheran Church on this All Saints Sunday, as we remember those whom we have loved and lost and on whose shoulders we stand. Next week is Consecration Sunday, and if you haven't returned your pledges, please come next week and uh, as we prepare for a new year. Let us worship. Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, you have knit together your elect in one communion and fellowship in the mystical body of your Son, Christ our Lord. Give us grace so to follow your blessed saints in all virtuous and godly living, that we may come to those ineffable joys that you have prepared for those who unfeignedly love you, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who with you and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns, one God, in glory everlasting. Amen. A reading from Ephesians. I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints, and for this reason I do not cease to give thanks for you as I remember you in my prayers. I pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation as you come to know him, so that with the eyes of your heart enlightened, you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, 
what are the riches of his glorious inheritance among the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power for us who believe according to the working of his power. God put this power to work in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age to come. And he has put all things under his feet and has made him the head over all things for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Before I get in full swing, I've got to kind of read the room and name the condition of all of our hearts after the end of a magical run for the Philadelphia Phillies. Um, there has, uh, you know, I'll always be a Twins fan deep down, but I, my, my NL team now, I've got this uh, little Phillies fan that's emerged within me, uh, which I know because not only was I excited about the wins, but I'm feeling sad about the loss. The papers say hopefully it's just the beginning of a multi-year run, a lot of young talent, and um, so I know we had some members who went to some of the games. I understand the tickets averaged about $3,000 per seat, some of them as high as $20,000 on the secondary market, but during the series, I, I learned of a way you could get one for free. It's a very straightforward way to do it, but not a lot of people could pull it off. All you have to do is live to be 104 years old, <laughs> like Thelma Williams. Maybe a few of you knew Thelma. She was a St. Paul's member. She lives down in Texas now, 104 years old. You could see her in our volunteer office, writing out notes to young families and their newborns or taking messages. She moved to Texas to be closer to her family, and I believe it was game two. She got valet service to go to the game, wonderful seat, and as a veteran of World War II, she was honored between the third and fourth innings of game two. She said, Pastor Russert, it was the most wonderful experience of my life. <laughs> Can you imagine saying that at 104 years old? <laughs> They announced her age and her military service, and the whole stadium erupted in applause. Golly, Pastor Russert, she said, I had more pictures with people that day than I ever have in my whole life. Thelma Williams, she's a hero, an inspiration. She's a living saint. I share this story about Thelma, who is still with us, because All Saints Sunday is just as much about the living as it is about the dead. The saints above challenge us to live in a certain way while we still have breath. To embody the surprising and world-reversing ways of God like we just heard from Luke's gospel. Everything was upside down about what he said. Love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. What a timely message two days before a midterm election. We can hold those verses close. Pray for those who abuse you. It's a world in which an Astros fan spills beer on a Phillies fan and lives to tell the tale. Love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. For some, that call to forgive, to bless, or to make peace with someone may be with someone who has died. We don't refer to the dead as saints because they were all perfect on earth. They most certainly weren't. Some of them may have been downright mean while they were here, done regrettable things, Yet by faith, we call them saints, trusting that God has made things right with them. They're in heaven. They're now our balcony people, as we say each year, calling us to live in a certain way. 
to learn from their mistakes, to break any chain or cycle of sin that might have carried on in them, to live with courage, to be radically different like Jesus, to live a little bit like Sophia. Sophia is a character from a Thornton Wilder novel I'm reading called The Eighth Day. And she, I think, would have been best friends with Thelma Williams. The story is set in southern Illinois in the early 1900s, Model T's coming off the line. And in this story, Sophia's father is wrongly accused of a murder and he's sentenced to death. The loss of her father leaves her mother driftless, unable to provide for the family. Sophia was about 14 years old. She'd stay with the family, but her older brother left for Chicago to try to find work, to send money home. Before he left, he looked Sophia in the eye just days after they'd lost their father, and she said, now, Sophie, remember this. What's important starts right now. We'll need our wits about us. We've got to be fighters. Sophie tells her brother to write to her from Chicago to tell her everything, even if it was bad news that he couldn't get a job or he got sick or he got injured. She said, promise to write what's true. You can't ask somebody to be brave without giving them something to be brave about. What a message for All Saints Sunday. What's important starts right now. For those who have lost someone, what do you have to be brave about? Sophia had to be brave for her two sisters, still there in the house. She had to be brave for her mother. Winter was coming. They had to keep the house warm, keep the family out of the poorhouse, which was literally 14 miles away. It was midsummer. She bought 10 lemons. She bought five cents worth of ice. She swallowed her pride and she carted it to the railway, railroad station in town to sell lemonade. It's quite an accomplishment. A hundred years ago, it would have been scandalous. This young girl, moreover, people thought her father was a murderer. They're having the audacity to try to sell lemonade at the local railroad station. Wilder wrote, a spectacle of great misfortune, of happiness overthrown, of a desperate struggle for existence, arouses conflicting emotions. Do you help a little girl selling lemonade, or do you judge her? Get on the train. She ended up making money. Then she began selling books at the railroad, railroad station. It was an early Jeff Bezos operation for Sophia. Next, she transformed her family home. They had this large home, and she transformed it, this industrious 14-year-old girl, to offer room and board for travelers as a way to make money, and the family made it. Wilder wrote, Sophia saved the Ashley family through the exercise of hope. Maybe you've been there to some small degree or great degree. You've lost someone, and yet you remain what do you have to be brave about? What hope from heaven keeps you going? Yuri Kurpatenko helped save his country through the exercise of hope and bravery. He was an orchestra conductor from Kherson, Ukraine. I read about him in The Economist obituary a couple weeks ago. They called him a Ukrainian patriot, none more so than he. He was a man of principle. He longed throughout his life for Ukraine to turn westward toward the liberal values of Europe, the rule of law, open, free, fair elections. When Re Russia began shooting protesters and resistors in Kherson, many citizens fled for their lives, but Yuri stayed. Later, this last fall, he was invited to conduct a concert in Kherson. Imagine that, a concert in the midst of 
this war. The concert had been dreamt up by the Russian authorities to promote Putin's lies that Kherson was a peaceful, civilized place under Russian occupation. What would prove it more than a concert by the region's finest musicians? And many of the musicians, the orchestra players, were either convinced or forced to play, yet the conductor, Yuri, refused. Even when the Russian special forces, special services visited his apartment to talk to him about the invitation in September, he refused. He turned them away. They said they'd be back. And they came back with a machine gun and gunned him down. A Kherson saint who lived with courage. Many saw him as a Don Quixote <clears throat> the last decade, a man just jousting with windmills. But now his story is being told around the world. He loved, he lost. Yet he had something to be brave about. Not to wield weapons, but to wield his gift of music, his voice, his orchestra. Turning the other cheek is no weak endeavor. It's incredibly brave. One colleague, a Russian speaker who now conducts the orchestra in Prague, said, Art and war are surely in stark opposition to each other. Art is about spirituality. That means to sustain people, not bring them down. And with that comes a certain responsibility. For Yuri, it was the responsibility to be brave about something while he still had life. All of the darkness there in Ukraine makes me realize that Daniel's apocalyptic vision of kingdoms and rulers fighting one another, maybe it's more relevant to the present than we might think. You can see in the contextual notes in the bulletin that we've added, the book of Daniel was written in the second century BCE when the Syrian king was persecuting the Jewish people, invading their lands, displacing them. Again, a very contemporary theme. And Daniel had a dream. It was of four beasts, four rulers who would wreak havoc on their neighbors. But in the dream also came a promise, something to be brave about. It was God's promise that the holy ones of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, forever and ever. What to make of dreams like Daniel's, visions of spirits and things not of this world? One scholar said, in modern days, dreams are psychologized almost entirely. It's just something happening in the brain. But in antiquity, the dream was a way to get in touch with the saints, to get in touch with the numinous world. Is it possible that that still happens today? Are balcony people just a figment, figment of our imagination to make us feel better? Or is there something to it? Are they really with us somehow? Helping us be brave about what we're still here to do. I trust it's more than fairy tales that those we've loved and lost are still with us. I like how C.S. Lewis frames it. He said of the spirit world, there are two equal and opposite errors into which we fall when we think about the spiritual world. One is to disbelieve in their existence. The other is to believe and to feel an excessive and unhealthy interest in them. Hold it in balance. This is how it was for Barbara Holmes. She's a professor, a former seminary president. She had a faith-shaping experience when she was a little girl. She had a dream, like Daniel, of the numinous world. 
an encounter with the spirit of her beloved great aunt's grace. She remembered she was lying in her grandmother's living room on a large footstool, and in the midst of a dream or something, she became aware, she said, of a sound that was like music but not music. She remembered feeling so happy to the point of bursting, and her beloved deceased Aunt Grace was there. She said, I didn't see her, but I knew she was nearby. Her closeness made me even happier. And they were simply together in this experience. Barbara was elated. Eventually, Aunt Grace said goodbye. The sound of the music faded, and Barbara ran into the next room to tell the rest of her family members who were gathered there. And her family's Christian faith had a mystic side to it. As she wrote, everybody knows that the dead come back to offer warnings, to bring messages from the other side. She said, I couldn't come up with any specific message, with any deep wisdom from my visit from Aunt Grace. But one family member said, let us know if she comes to you again. Held it loosely, but didn't disbelieve the possibility like C.S. Lewis Let us know if she comes to you again. They didn't make the error of disbelieving in their existence, but didn't feel an excessive interest either. Simply let us know if she comes again. For Barbara, as a little girl, it was a message of validation. Let us know if she comes again, whether to comfort you when you're afflicted or afflict you when you're comfortable, as we say. One of our members lost her loved one this last year. And she told me about a book that she's been reading over the last month or so. Book's called Answering God's Call. She's already dreaming up a small group for it for the spring semester. A scripture-based journey for older adults. The book included a prayer about being brave, whether you're in your 70s or 80s or 90s. And the prayer said, Lord, grant me the grace to live in the present and recognize what is possible. To look to the future and trust you. To humbly adapt to change. To serve. And to graciously accept being served. To give generously to have courage in times of trial, to look forward to the future with hope. In other words, to live like Thelma, that saint down in Texas, while we still have time left. Thelma was wonderful on the phone the other day. She asked about the church. She said how much she missed it. She just can't find anything Like St. Paul's, she said, she asked about my kids, remembered them. And I asked her, Thelma, any secrets of life that you can pass on to me? And she said, oh, I don't know. Just take it one day at a time, and then you realize you're old. (laughs) Thanks, Thelma. (laughs) She said, I'm slowing down now. I don't see much anymore, can hardly hear, but I'm thankful for what I can do. What a brave thing to say. You've loved and lost, but Jesus and all the saints are saying you're still here. You can do something for God's sake. What would it look like for you to sell a glass of lemonade?
day we remember with thanksgiving those members and friends of our congregation who have entered the church triumphant during the past year. Ruth Galligan, Carolyn Lloyd, Shirley Helmstetter, Lois Trauger, Joan Whitworth, Dennis Baker, Edmund Knight, Andrew Caprari, George Dauber, Karen Capella, Thomas Lacey Sr., Albert Kinzinger, William Hawksworth, Mildred Taylor, James Cauley Jr., Merle Downs, Robert Labar, Hazel Harpster, Morgan Whitney, Landon Daprill, Rowena Kraus, Isabel Burchick, Shirley Teschner, Joseph Bean, Teresa Johnson, Arthur Balick, Elaine Conrad, Elaine Harton, James Corcoran, Ruth Slifer, Eileen Sayer, Ralph Kleesner, Mary Van Luveny, Thomas Parla, Bernie Terrebon, Janie Vaughn, Augustus Campion, Gerald Schmidt, Richard Wassley, William Engelhart, David Finger, William Mattern, Mary Jane Sargent, Yuri Kerpetenko, and guests from the Code Blue Shelter, Karen Anani, Stephen Riberty, and Grant Brown. After a moment of silence, let us pray. Almighty God, grant us grace so to follow your blessed saints in all virtues and godly living. Help us to walk worthily of those in whose unseen presence life is lived. Help us to have in our lives their courage and danger, 
their steadfastness in trial, their perseverance in difficulty, their loyalty when loyalty is costly, their love which nothing can change, their joy which can take nothing away. Lord, so grant to us in your good time never to forget those who have gone before so that in the life to come we may share their blessedness through Jesus Christ our Lord in whose name we are bold to say our Father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever amen the lord bless you and keep you the lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you the lord look upon you with favor and give you peace amen